her introduction that, okay. Uh, uh, that uh, my wife and I were in Florida uh, three weeks ago birding. And uh, we actually ended our trip the last three days in Fort Myers Beach, went to uh, Sanibel to the Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge, went to Cape Coral to look at burrowing owls. And um, it's, it's really heartbreaking to see the uh, devastation there and after talking to people there. So I, uh, it, it's been hard in some ways thinking about this and thinking about the people there but uh, I hope you'll join me in expressing that our thoughts and prayers are with everybody affected. Uh, one thing that has not gotten much coverage is the wildlife. Uh, there was a little note I saw the other day from National Audubon, uh, and I saw something today from uh, Ding Darling, uh, terrible losses there. And um, I saw a note that uh, no birds were being heard anywhere in that area. So we hope obviously for, for the best there both for the people and for the animals that were affected. So as Barb said, I, uh, I began this talk or began this story uh, a number of years ago when I was newsletter editor for Meadowlark Audubon Society in Cody, Wyoming. I am uh, in my mid sixties and I've been interested in birds since I was about five years old and started birding professionally, or seriously, I should say, probably in uh, when I was in college and have continued doing it. But it wasn't until I became vice president uh, and newsletter editor that I started really thinking about ways that I could combine my interest in birds with my interest in history. Um, and one of the first things that I ran across was this quote in, the foreword that Roger Tory Peterson wrote to Roger Pasquier's Watching Birds. Although birds do not change, bird watchers do. And that thought has been rattling around in my mind for a long time. How did bird watchers change and why? So the history of ornithology is actually, it's not a new area. Uh, people have been uh, writing about this since the 1700s, but really in the last two decades has come into its own. You see uh, my bookshelf there, the, uh, the whole middle shelf is filled with books on the history of ornithology, history of bird watching. Uh, there are new things coming out every day, uh, not every day, but every year. And you know, I hope that my uh, work will contribute to the understanding of the history of ornithology, the history of bird watching as a, an aspect of social and cultural history. So bird watching versus birding. I, I tend to think of myself as a bird watcher, although I, I am a birder in the sense of keeping a list. But here is a uh, one definition of the difference between the two. If you notice birds while traveling, you're a bird watcher. If you travel to see birds, you're a birder. If you drive to see rare birds, you're a birder. If your friend drags you along, you're a bird watcher. So uh, that, that's one perspective on the difference between the two. Uh, I made this list of kind of attributes of um, uh, the two that um, kind of compare and contrast bird watching being informal, birding being formal, bird watching being casual, birding being more serious, one being unintentional, the other more deliberate, one being aimless in the sense that you're just watching birds, the other having a purpose in mind, one being naive in the sense that a lot of people who watch birds don't really know what they're looking at. Uh, people who are birders obviously tend to be much more informed. There are people who are more amateur, novices, and people who are more professional. People who are unequipped, you know, that watch birds with, uh, with their naked eyes. They don't use scopes and binoculars and so forth. And then there are birders who are really well outfitted and have the state of the art. Uh, John Hartley Lorton, who is a uh, British ornithologist, gave an oral history back in 2014, and he talked about bird watching being a spectrum. He talked about how at different times, sometimes even on the same day, he can be a serious birder. He can be out looking for rarities. He can be a purposeful birder. He can be undertaking research, doing uh, studies of distribution, population, whatever. 
And sometimes he said he'll just sit back for an hour or so and watch a marsh harrier swoop around just for the pure joy and pleasure of uh, watching birds. So, you know, keep in mind that even though I'm talking about uh, differences between bird watching and birding and the evolution of bird watching into birding, that I don't want to suggest that at any given moment, any of us can be uh, doing any, uh, any place on that spectrum. But Roger Tor Peterson uh, wrote quite actually several times about what he called the metamorphosis of the birder, going from a looker to a lister, to a traveler, to a competitor, and ultimately to what he called the full-fledged watcher. Uh, as he turns around, ticking off the birds on his checklist, he and we would say he or she inevitably becomes interested in a uh, bird's way of life. So Peter, Peterson is suggesting that uh, people begin by bird watching and progress to a point where they become really interested in how birds live. And rather than listing, they begin the serious study of a particular type of bird or, or uh, different uh, species of birds. Well, in some ways he's right, but in other ways he had it backwards. Uh, if you look at the history of bird watching, it's really that bird watching was the serious side of things back in the 19th century. And as this flow chart on the left suggests, bird watching led to what we know now today as field ornithology. And about the same time as the evolution of bird watching to field ornithology was taking place, bird watching was also developing into birding. And I'll talk about, uh, about that as we go forward. But I bear in mind that there's kind of a couple of different trajectories going on here, both in this country and in Europe. So there's roughly a thousand North American birds. And uh, if you uh, think about it, there are only a handful who have names that end in ing. Uh, the burrowing owl, the worm eating warbler, the wandering tattler, just about every other bird is named for somebody or named for an aspect of its plumage, uh, named for uh, uh, the area in which it's located. Why is that? Why, why are so few birds named because of their behavior? Well, one reason is that ornithologists traditionally studied dead birds and they were sitting in their uh, museums or their offices, wherever, looking at specimens of dead birds, and they named birds based on what they saw in front of them or who they knew had uh, collected it or who they knew had uh, um, made a contribution in the field, whatever. It's, it's kind of a commentary on how birds were not regarded as living, which is ironic given ornithology being the study of birds. Likewise, ornithological journals, Auk, Condor, Ibis, you look down in the lower corner, there's your own journal, Cassinia, they tend to be names after birds. And remarkably, it's not until 1962 with the publication of The Living Bird that anybody notes that, hey, as Roger Tory Peterson did when he gave the name to the journal, birds are alive. That's the most important thing about them. They're out there and they fly, they, they do all sorts of interesting things. Uh, but it, it's really to me kind of startling that it wasn't until 1962 that a journal took the name The Living Bird. Maybe you can say it was taken for granted, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a, I think an interesting thing. I'm gonna be talking primarily about the Western tradition, but I do wanna make sure to underscore that um, people have been looking at living birds for as long as we've been humans. And in particular, uh, indigenous, and indigenous and folk cultures have uh, a lot of knowledge about birds. This is a wonderful anecdote told by Amadeo Ray, who is really the founder of what's emerging as a subdiscipline called ethno-ornithology, which is, uh, interviewing people, uh, looking at uh, archival records and trying to elicit the information that is uh, contained about birds that, that indigenous and, and uh, people have and what folklore has. He tells a story about the poor will 
in uh, what is now Arizona, that the Pima Indians knew way back when that the poor whale hibernated and they use as a metaphor in conquering uh, the Gila River area, they called upon the poor whale shaman to put the enemy to sleep so that he could be conquered. And as Ray said, who else knew this stuff? It wasn't until the 1940s that uh, Western ornithologists realized that there was a bird that hibernates. So we'll spend a few minutes talking about uh, how terms change because I think that provides some context for how birds watching changed. There are different meanings for words and phrases about walking birds that change as it was first used back in the 1700s and really up until the late 19th to sit in fields to drive the birds away. They were bird watchers and they used clappers or noisemakers to drive away the birds. It's really not until the end of the 19th century uh, that people begin referring to bird watching in the, as the action, the activity of actually watching birds to learn how they live. This book by a uh, British ornithologist, Edmund Silas, was the first to really coin or popularize the phrase bird watching. The birder, uh, birders up through, really through the mid, the early decades of the 20th century were people who hunted birds. There weren't people who watched birds, they went out to, to kill birds. Of course, the birder today is somebody who goes out with the purpose of uh, watching birds, counting them, uh, just watching what they do, adding to his or her list. Uh, but again, that's really not until 1935 do you begin to see the term birder in print. And to go a birding, to go birding, up until the late 19th century meant hunting wild birds for food or sport. Uh, Shakespeare has this line, uh, her husband goes this morning a birding. And it's not until 1900, Florence Miriam's book, A Birding on a Bronco, she defines birding as the activity of going out and, and looking at birds. And lastly, field ornithology, going out presumably to spend time with birds in the field. In 1874, Elliot Cowes, leading ornithologist of his time, wrote this manual of field ornithology and uh, it was about, uh, your object is to get all the birds you can. A good day's work is 50 birds shot. A very good day is even better than that. Uh, so it was all about going out and getting as many birds as you could with your gun. 40 years later, in Charles Maynard's Field Ornithology, his book is actually dedicated to all who study, who love to study living birds. So a real difference, a shift in 40 years. Also to provide context here, how did ornithology as a discipline change uh, really over about a 200 year time span? Well, these two books written in the closing quarter of the 17th century, uh, John Ray's The Ornithology of Francis Willoughby and uh, his other book, The Wisdom of God, really launched what we know as the discipline of ornithology, provided a, uh, a basis for beginning the systematic study of birds and also the field study of birds. But very quickly, ornithology really divided into two streams. On the one hand was systematic, and which is actually on the right side of the screen as you're looking at it. And on the left side is field ornithology. If you look on the, if you look at this diagram pretty closely, you don't see much happening in terms of field ornithology. There weren't a lot of contributions being made because people were spending their time in the lab. It was the era of what was known as shotgun ornithology. Uh, the destruction as a rule of small birds with the least possible injury to their plumage. Again, uh, quoting from Elliot Cowes. And gathering and collecting birds' eggs, birds' nests. This illustration from Frank Leslie's Weekly, 1888, shows a, an ornithologist 
lowering down a bag containing uh, bird nests and, and bird eggs. It says that the flag, there are countless flocks here and all of these birds have nests with eggs in them. There's just an unlimited collection that you can get. This was the golden era of what was called cabinet ornithology. That photograph there is uh, some of the trays from your own institution, the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, which in the mid 19th century had the best ornithological collection in the world. Uh, and its collection of eggs was almost uh, the best in the world. Uh, there were, you know, other museums certainly had collections that were uh, rivaling or approaching theirs and others would soon follow with the American Museum of Natural History, the Field Museum. Uh, but again, this was largely the era in which ornithology was done in museums. In other words, some exceptions, there were amateur uh, naturalists, amateur ornithologists, if you will, and perhaps the best known of these was a parson in England, a man named Gilbert White, who called himself an outdoor naturalist in a letter he wrote in 1769. And he recorded what he saw. He went out into the field, wrote down every day what he saw, and then wrote letters to his friends talking about natural history, about the lives and conversations of animals, which he said are the life and soul of natural history. And his writing sparked a genre of people going out and writing about their experiences interacting with nature, whether it was birds or some other aspect. A lot of people read White and were inspired by him. Among them was this fellow, a man named Charles Darwin, who uh, said from reading White's Natural History of Selborne, I took much pleasure in watching the habits of birds and made notes on the subject. And those notes got him thinking about natural selection and evolution culminating in his publication in 1859 on the origin of species, which transformed ornithology. It brought it into the realm of the biological sciences. But this wonderful line from Margaret Atwood, the living bird it's not its, is not its labeled bones. It had to remind ourselves, we, I'm talking about back in the 19th century, that birds were alive and that uh, they're not simply uh, bags of bones and skin. There are living creatures, living organisms. There were people who were looking at birds, but they were dismissed by ornithologists. Robert Ridgway wrote this in 1901. He talked about how popular ornithology is entertaining. That's fascinating things connected with out of their nature, but it's systematic ornithology, which is a part of biology, the study of life, that's more instructive and therefore more important. He and others really dismissed the idea of going out into the field. They thought it was sentimental, they thought it was romantic, and ultimately they thought it was unscientific. Others begged to disagree. Again, Charles Maynard, who I uh, uh, showed earlier. Today, there is another class of ornithologists who by far outnumber the professional and who want to know living birds, want to understand the, the ways that they live, want to go out in the field and see them. And they're part of what I have begun to think of as a revolution that was <coughs> taking place in the last three decades of the 19th century, continuing into the 20th century. A revolution I call the rediscovery of the living bird. Obviously people had known living birds and had seen living birds, but there is just an enormous upsurge in art about birds, in books about birds in keeping wild birds, in feeding wild birds, in protecting wild birds. It's, it's unparalleled, it's unlike anything that went before it. And there's also an enormous upsurge in people watching birds going out into the field and seeing what they did. And when I say people doing this, I'm primarily talking about non-ornithologists who were doing this. And they're relying on a host of new tools and techniques, some borrowed from hunting, some borrowed from the military, some invented for the purpose. Uh, field notebooks, field glasses, cameras, bird banding, using blinds, all these tools are being used by people who are by and large not scientists, but going out into the field to watch birds. And there's two um, 
approaches that are developing to knowing the living bird. One is bird watching, which is primarily European, Great Britain and the continent. The other is bird study, which is developing in North America. Bird watching is mainly undertaken by adult men. Its emphasis is on studying particular aspects and it ultimately becomes a very collaborative undertaking. Bird study is uh, mainly undertaken by women and children and the emphasis is understanding how birds live with the idea of preparing life histories, increasingly becomes interested in problems of identification. It's mainly individuals, but there are some collaborative efforts. And I'm gonna talk a little more in detail about both of these. So the European approach, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, there's a lot going on in Europe and I can only give a, uh, pardon the pronoun, bird's eye view of what's happening, but uh, people in, in uh, Europe on the continent and in Great Britain are establishing bird observatories, stations to uh, study topics such as bird migration. They're pioneering the study of bird behavior. Edmund Silos, Elliot Howard, who defined the concept of territory. They're watching birds, looking at, at how they behave and drawing comparisons between how birds behave and people behave. They launch their own journal to promote organized systematic studies of birds. One of the leaders of this was a man named Edward, he went by the name of Max Nicholson, his middle name, who was a real advocate for professionalizing bird watching. He believed that it was, as a science, it was part and parcel of ornithology. What was needed was to formalize it and make it into an organized profession. He wrote this up in a book called The Art of Bird Watching. <clears throat> and he and others in England and on the continent were applying the tools of science to study birds applying mapping techniques to map territory, to survey birds in the field, applying techniques to measure nesting and feeding behavior and other types of activities. And he saw uh, a whole agenda of tasks that need to be done in order for progress in ornithology to be made, studying bird population, bird communities, territory, bird psychology, a whole list of things kind of bucket lists of uh, topics that needed to be pursued by studying birds in the wild. And he and his followers uh, developed new organizations, the British Trust for Ornithology, the Edward Gray Institute based at Oxford University to undertake the effort of studying birds in a professional way with an organized core of observers. And you may recognize the gentleman on the left there, he reviewed uh, Nicholson's book, Whitmer Stone. And he said that uh, ornithology is now looking to bird watching for advancement. We had not realized what a science bird watching had become in America. We haven't even developed its distinctive name for the study, but it's happening, it's out there. Ornithology is getting everything that's new being done by people who are outside of the realm of ornithology. Here's one of the few American disciples of the European approach to watching birds. Margaret Morse Nice, you may know her. She wrote these amazing uh, monographs on song sparrows and um, had there been a, um, a Nobel prize for animal behavior, there's no question in my mind she would have won it. She just made incredible contributions that were far more in Europe than they were in this country. So let's talk now about the American approach bird study. Uh, and again, to give a little context here, this is the Victorian era and there is this craze for gathering plumes to put on hats, to put on uh, costumes, to put on apparel. Um, the list on the left, I'm sorry, on the right, this is an early example of a birders list kept by Frank Chapman when he was at the National Museum, uh, American Museum of Natural History, excuse me, he saw these birds on 14th Street. Well, he didn't see them as living birds. These are all the birds he recognized because of the plumage on ladies' hats that he saw as they walked past him. So like 41 species of birds. Uh, some bird species were being almost driven to extinction because of hunting and or specimen collecting passenger pigeons, Carolina parakeets are just two examples. And there's a growing outcry that's prompting this crusade to protect wild birds. 
uh, beginning in the 1860s, 1870s. Uh, and it's largely led by reform-minded progressive era women who, you know, they took umbrage with cartoons like the one on the left that would show it's women who are responsible for the demise of birds and instead are leading the effort to uh, protect birds, nesting birds, migrating birds, what have you. And these progressive women uh, also develop a kind of a nonviolent alternative approach, which is going out into nature to learn how birds live. This wonderful book by Amanda Harris, How We Went Birds Nesting. We didn't go out to collect birds nests. We went out to look for birds nests, hunted for ourselves, waited patiently and watched and observed. We didn't, didn't have any books. We learned by watching. Uh, one of the leaders of both movements, both the effort to protect birds and the effort to encourage people to study birds, Olive Thorne Miller, she wrote uh, nearly a dozen books and essays. Men have been studying the dead bird for many years, all about it is well known, but in order to really know the living bird, that kind of study has hardly begun. So she writes these books advocating for going out and studying birds in the field not simply for the sake of science, but also to foster empathy. It is life, not death. It is a living, loving, hopeless, working fellow creature that the student, the bird student I speak of, shall study. Uh, one of her good friends, Mabel Osgood Wright, she wrote the first field guide, a book called Birdcraft, which had color plates. It had species descriptions, all the attributes we would associate with a modern field guide. But she and others thought that identification was only the beginning. The real purpose was to study the living bird, to see the living bird in his love songs, his house building, his haunts, his migrations, to make detailed observations of how birds live. And bird study proponents think of life histories of individual biography, individual birds, kind of their biographies as an ultimate goal. There's hundreds and hundreds of species of birds. Let's write their biographies. Let's make sure we get to know them as fellow creatures. Uh, one of the few ornithologists who uh, really became active in this movement and indeed provided a lot of leadership <clears throat> was a man named Frank Chapman. Some of you may know his name. excuse me, uh, his motto was, if you really, to really know birds, you must study them. He was particularly interested in educating the rising generation of uh, people interested in birds, young people. He himself got started, he was gonna be a banker, but he loved birds. And finally one day he decided, I, I, I'm gonna pursue my heart's dream. He went to work as a volunteer at the American Museum of Natural History, he got hired on and spent his career there. Early on, he spent most of his time collecting birds, going out into the field, collecting birds, and then putting together these kind of uh, uh, lackluster, for want of a better term, displays of stuffed birds. But the more he did these things, the more he realized it was very humbling to him that he was collecting. He wasn't studying. I was collecting birds rather than studying them. My observations were casual, not continuous. They were made with no definite object in view. And so he follows his own advice, go yourself to the field and learn that books do not exist solely in books. So in beginning in the late 1890s and really for the next 30 years, almost 40 years, he goes out and spends most of his time in the field studying birds throughout North America, down in Central America. <clears throat> he spent a lot of time down in Central America um, and he had a motive for doing a lot of this because he had been asked by the uh, director of the National the American Museum to redo some of the bird displays. And so he developed what were known as habitat groups, which sought to portray birds as they would live. If you were an observer in the field, how would it look? A colony of flamingos, uh, a group of egrets in a swamp, a uh, group of ptarmigans on a mountain hillside, he hired bird artists, uh, Luis Fuertes among them, and uh, created these amazingly detailed 
amazingly lifelike dioramas. <clears throat> he also wrote uh, two field guides, he wrote a field guide rather, a manual, Birds of Eastern North America. He wrote it first in 1895 and revised it in 1912. He felt he had to revise it because the day of the bird collector had passed is now the day of the bird student. And by comparison, the first edition had 32 pages on collecting and preserving birds, nothing on bird study. But the second edition had nothing on collecting and 126 pages of advice and questions and instruction on how to study birds. This whole era uh, through Chapman and others was, uh, in fact, Chapman, Chapman himself coined the phrase, the epic of popular bird study. Classroom study, uh, museum study, you see kids looking at one of his dioramas. Uh, a lot of people brought into birding. On the lower left there, you see the uh, uh, charter or the abstract of proceedings of the Delaware Valley Ornithological Club, one of many that uh, birding clubs that were formed in the closing decades of the 19th and early decades of the 20th centuries. Chapman introduced the uh, Christmas bird count in 1901. <clears throat> he said, instead of going out and shoot birds in the field, why don't we go out and count them on one day? Um, proponents of bird study were, uh, I had said this a little, a little while ago, just to reiterate, were saying it was not the be all and end all. It was only the beginning of the quest. It's the beginning of the quest, which may bring us into close intimacy with the secrets of nature. However, as time went on, uh, bird study tend to become more and more about learning how to identify birds in the field very quickly. And the bird books and the field guides that were written from say 1905 on tended to be really dry treatises about hints for um, observing birds in the field. Which brings us to a case study a tale of two friends, a field guider and a full-fledged watcher. A kind of a parallel in some ways, but their, their lives parallel the larger transformations that were going on in terms of how bird watching was changing. One of the two was Roger Torrey Peterson. I don't know that I need to say much about him. People know a lot about him. The greatest popularizer of bird study the country has ever known. He became fascinated by birds as a young boy. Here you see his field notes. He started sketching birds. And from a sketcher of birds, he grew to become what many people would call the successor of John James Audubon. He was influenced by a nature writer, Ernest Thompson Seton, who wrote this book called Two Little Savages, a, a story of boy's story. And the, the uh, Jan, uh, one of the people in this book uh, talked about ways that you could look at birds markings close up and you could uh, kind of identify them. And so Peterson tried that and it worked. Well, about the same time that uh, he's doing this work, Joseph is uh, coming of age in the Bronx, Hunts Point. He said, we played a lot in the park and local woods we could see 50 kind of birds on a May morning. Uh, he and his friends, the Bronx bird watching boys, they uh, pulled a beaten up copy of the birds in New York State out of a trash can and made up their own field guide along with their own copy of the Reed Bird Guide. And they went out and they looked at birds. They were Boy Scouts, their scoutmaster encouraged this. And in October of 1924, he and his friends joined the Linnaean Society of New York Again, another, uh, it started out as a general natural history society, but it become really a birding group in uh, New York, a thriving birding group. And uh, there Hickey and his friends met, who Hickey called the greatest list chaser of all time, Ludlow Grissom, who had been working at the uh, Museum of Natural History along with Frank Chapman. And Chapman, I'm sorry, Grissom had made a name for himself by being able to identify almost any bird, uh, almost at a glance. And as Hickey said, he had a slightly disastrous effect on us. We were simply laced list chasers. <clears throat> and a month after they uh, joined the Linnaean Society, Hickey and his friends formed their own group 
the Bronx Bird Club, which had uh, different functions. One is to undertake Christmas bird counts. Another is to collect, conduct field outings. But their primary goal was to make an organized assault on Grissom's data re regarding Bronx birds. The late, the arrival and late dates made a glorious time breaking records. So they're all about going out and trying to see, identify birds, see them before anybody else does, or see more than anybody else does. Well, in 1927, Roger Tory Peterson moved to New York City to study art. And he went to a meeting of the Linnaean Society and there he met Hickey. Hickey invited him to join the, the Bronx County Bird Club. And with Peterson's help, the Bronx County birders begin in compiling these incredible bird lists. They're, they're just wiping out the competition from other New York birders. Grissom was just astonished at the, uh, the number of birds that these boys could spot. But Peterson begins to notice a change in his good friend. Hickey had gone through the usual cycle with his field glass, but the law of diminishing returns had set in and his zealous interest lapsed. There's a, Hickey sprawled out, uh, well, he's supposed to be out on a field trip. <clears throat> it looked as though another ardent follower of the cult, the bird watching listing cult had been lost. But Hickey had the good fortune through the Linnaean Society to meet a young German emigre, a rising star in the field of ornithology, a man by the name of Ernst Meyer, a protege of a German ornithologist named Erwin Stressman, a leading figure in, the, uh, in uh, advocating for the field studies of birds and bird behavior. So Mayer joins the ornithology department at American Museum of Natural History. And he goes out birding with uh, Hickey and his friends. And he tells, he realizes that they don't really know a lot about the field of ornithology. And so he decides to have what he called a journal club in his office. He would bring the boys in, they would read through ornithological journals and they would talk about research. They would talk about what was being done in the field of ornithology. He convinced Hickey to take, uh, read the entire publication of British Birds, which had begun publishing in 1907, Hickey would go to work and he would take volumes from the New York Public Library and he would read these on the subway from cover. And he talked about how this uh, intellectual pursuit uh, where you were just, instead of just listing birds, you know, becoming emotionally involved and watching them, he said it was a turning point in his life. And in 1936, Hickey becomes the leader of the Linnaean Society. And he shifts its focus from being about identifying birds to studying them. If you look at the bibliographies, there are all sorts of studies they start doing, some of which are, are pioneering in terms of uh, studies of birds, particularly in and around uh, New York, New England, uh, and New Jersey. Well, what they had begun to call themselves the Mayorites and the Grissomites didn't have a whole lot to uh, do with one another. Uh, if there was one thing, this is Ernst Meyer, if there's one thing American bird watchers never did, it was to watch a bird. As soon as it was checked off the list, on they went. That's not science, that's just sport. List chasing does not produce amateur natural, naturalists of the tradition of Edmund Silas, and A. Howard, those uh, pioneering students of bird behavior. So Hickey becomes a disciple of uh, Meyer. And uh, by the 1930s, he has made a name for himself as a field researcher. Here you see him banding puffins in New England. And uh, through meeting Aldo Leopold, the great environmentalist and father of game management, met him at a cocktail party at the Yale Club Leopold was really interested in what he was doing and uh, convinced uh, Hickey that he should go on for graduate training in ornithology. And uh, he applied to the University of Wisconsin and was accepted, studied under Leopold, <clears throat> and wrote his master's bird watching, published in 1943, uh, clearly influenced by uh, Max Nicholson, who you may re remember wrote The Art of Bird Watching, all about bird watching. <clears throat> 
but it was not an identification guide. It was about the art of discovering how birds live, looking at the chapters there, migration watching, adventures in bird counting, adventures in bird distribution, the romance of bird banding, and he says the field card of ornithology measures success in terms of the rarity, the first migrants in a big list. Birds are scanned, but it can scarcely be said that they are being watched. Bird watching is much more than this. It is the art of discovering how birds live. It can be a contribution to science. So what's Hickey's old friend Peterson been up to in all these years? Well, he was refining his skills, both his artistic and his field identification skills. And he was giving a lot of thought to how he could uh, follow in Grissom's footsteps by putting together some sort of tool to help people watch birds and identify them quickly. And in 1934, after several efforts to get his book published, Odin Mifflin finally published a field guide to the birds. They only did 2000 copies because they didn't think anybody would buy it, sold out the very first day. Uh, and it was, as Bill Thompson, the late Bill Thompson said, a book that changed the world. <clears throat> it revolutionized uh, the way people looked at birds. It um, got people interested in watching birds, mainly to list birds. And it was a new approach that tried to simplify and make field identification of birds as efficient as possible, as quick, and as down and, easy, down and dirty, easy as it could be. It helps launch birding as a sport based on the rapid identification of birds, based on field marks and attributes. It goes through many editions. I have, these are my own copies of all the ones that Peterson himself did. Of course, they've been carried on <clears throat> since his death. The numbers tell it all. Uh, the two friends had very different trajectories, successes in terms of their books. Hickey's Guide sold 40,000 copies. Peterson's book, seven million copies and counting. And Peterson's Guide sparked just a bevy, a gaggle of field guides. Here's some, there are, there are so many more. And by the 1960s, birding had emerged as, as a profession. Hundreds of thousands of participants at its national organization, the American Birding Association. And for most of us, it's about the list. It's competing for the big year, competing to see who can see the most birds in a region, in a year, in a, uh, in a single day, whatever. And in some cases, it becomes an extreme sport to see every bird on earth. So, in 1982, uh, the three old friends, Meyer, Peterson, and Hickey, Grissom had died uh, back in the, the 50s, but the three of them <clears throat> got together for what would be their last time together in 1982. Uh, there you see them together. I, it must have been, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to hear what they would talk about. Uh, but in nine, that same year, Hickey somewhat chagrined and ruefully acknowledged that bird watching in the European sense had failed. My book never caught on. I was against list chasing and I argued that bird watching provided more lasting satisfaction. But bird listing is far bigger now than it was when I was a boy. If somebody tells you today is a bird watcher, bird watching in the European sense of the term certainly failed over here. So we're at a uh, a, a kind of another cusp moment, another uh, pivot point in the uh, evolution of watching birds. Real questions about how technology is changing and will change the field identification of birds. Merlin, uh, Bird App, the Digiscope, Peter Dunn uh, said that uh, you know, we may have a time come when we don't really watch birds in the field anymore. We take pictures of them you can even take pictures remotely, then you bring them back to your study, you sit down and look at the pictures and you identify the birds. Uh, we watch birds on bird cams. Uh, a little while ago, well, we were reading dinner, my wife was sharing with me a uh, video highlights of a uh, great horned owl webcam from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, so 
Interestingly, uh, Max Nicholson back in 1931 foresaw the day when people would bird by watching birds on television. Uh, I first gave this talk in 2012 and a decade has elapsed and you know, we've seen changes just in the rise of eBird, which now brings together a platform for people to contribute their sightings, contribute their data. The great backyard bird count, the, the great sit, the, the, uh, the, the quiet, the big sit, North American Breeding Bird Survey, the Project Feeder Watch, all these things were happening. And then the pandemic, when so many people discovered birding because they were at home, they were in quarantine and they uh, found birding was a good way to occupy their time. Who is the successor? I, you know, I think my candidate would be David Sibley because in some ways he combines the best of both Peterson and Hickey. He has the artistic abilities of Peterson. He has the uh, enthusiasm for living birds and bird study that um, Hickey brought to bear. So it's a helpful sign, I think, that his work is helping the two streams to converge once again. And Scott Wheatensall has this wonderful passage. The pendulum may be starting to swing the other way, back to birding's roots, to bird watching in the original sense of the word, where the bird exists not as a symbol or a tick mark or a challenge, but it exists as a, a living thing. Uh, is tempered by a celebration of the creature that makes it all possible, the small contained miracle that is a bird. So there's reasons for hope and there's reasons for hoopoo too, if you'll pardon the pun. I, uh, I, I was uh, unexpected, not expecting to see a hoopoo when I was in Xiamen, China and this bird obligingly hopped across the path and I, all I had with me was my cell phone. Uh, but I spent 15 minutes watching this hoopoo do its thing. And it gave me a lot of hope. I hope it gives you hope. So thanks for your interest and whether you're a, a birder or a bird watcher, uh, okay. I wish you well. And uh, it sounds like you've got a great program of uh, bird watching activities going on almost every day. And I applaud you for that. So thank you and uh, hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you, John.